Yeah. All right. Hope you're having a great morning session. So uh, quickly, Sydney Madison Prescott literally wrote the book on citizen development. Uh, it's actually called Robotic Process Automation with Studio X. And Sydney will be signing copies of the book on the grand patio from 1045 to 1145. Yeah. So um, I'd like to introduce our next guest. They're going to be talking about a human-led, tech-powered approach that delivers ROI. So please welcome to the stage Jonathan Finch from Amazon and Kevin Crone from PwC. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for attending our, uh, our talk today. So as a quick introduction, my name is Kevin Crowen. I'm a partner with PwC and lead our intelligent automation and digital upskilling efforts uh, for the US firm. Uh, Jonathan, maybe do you want to give an introduction to yourself and maybe talk a little bit about Amazon's treasury function, which I, I find fascinating because it, to me it's the, the combination of what a traditional treasury function is, um, almost with a full service financial services institution baked in. Yep. Yeah, Jonathan Finch, uh, Assistant Treasurer, Chief Technology Officer uh, for Amazon's Treasury and Risk Department. So, you know, I like to think about it in terms of kind of two main buckets. The first one is what most people in this room think about when they think about Treasury, which is, you know, uh, liquidity and cash management. Um, we've got complex pooling structures around the world, a lot of m uh, money movement, thousands of bank accounts, hundreds of legal entities, um, trading and investments. So we do tens of billions of FX trades per year. Um, you know, thousands per month. Um, so all the technology that supports the movement of cash and the conversion of, you know, dollars to euros, et cetera. Um, we've got our debt and capital markets team. So if you think about, you know, maybe the, the $18 billion bond issuance, you know, we did earlier this year, um, you know, commercial paper and uh, some short-term, long-term debt instruments. Um, so that's sort of your traditional treasury function and all the, you know, all the technology that sits behind that, that enables the movement of cash, the connectivity to banks. Um, and then the other side is uh, our, our risk and insurance. And so, um, y you know, I, I don't know what percentage of, of corporate treasuries have um, insurance, but it's probably in the neighborhood of, you know, 30 to 40 percent. Uh, for us, you think about risk management. Uh, we have our own insurance company, so we do self-insure. We've got about 30 insurance programs. Um, some of the ones that are, you know, that everyone knows about are property. You know, we've got 40 million square foot of office space at Amazon, so a lot of property uh, insurance. Um, and it's growing, you know, like crazy. So we've had, you know, obviously during COVID, a lot of growth. We've hired a million employees, uh, which is crazy and mind-blowing to think about that. Um, but fulfillment centers, you know, hiring in fulfillment centers, more fulfillment centers equals, you know, workers' compensation claims. You know, when I started Amazon, we were outsourcing a lot of our package delivery. And so now we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of fleet vehicles on the road. And so everything from a rock chip to, you know, a more serious accident results in a claim. And so you got 30 insurance programs. And so from a tech perspective, um, all the technology that processes claims that, you know, helps us digitize our, our captive, uh, you know, helps us calculate, you know, the financial risk to Amazon. Uh, so metrics like T-Core, total cost of risk, those types of things. So, so um, I, you know, I think the message to take away from that is that the function does a lot as a very, um, what I would call highly distributed level of responsibilities across a lot of different things. And so um, the, the, the need for automation and the challenge for implementing it, I think, has some kind of unique characteristics. Um, so as I think about the, the journey you've been on, Jonathan, for the, the, the last couple of years with automation, I like to think about it in sort of a three-phase journey. There's the kind of getting initial momentum and excitement and convincing everyone for the need for it. There is the scaling aspect. And then there's really the culture change aspect, which I think, given the, the unique nature of the organization, is really important. Maybe let's, let's start on the first for, um, you know, for a minute. Um, you know, getting initial excitement. How did that happen? What was maybe one of the, 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 the killer use cases? And then, you know, Amazon's got some unique um, probably aspects in terms of how things get publicized. Um, how, did you, how, did you, how did you create that internal momentum? I think the first thing, what's unique about us is the growth has just been like it's hyper growth. And, you know, historically within the function that I manage, you know, like a lot of, um, you know, finance functions, so throwing operational headcount to solve the problem, you, you can do that for a while. Um, but at some point in time, you have to invest in technology. And so, 
Um, I think when my team was started and when I founded and built the charter, there was already initial excitement just having a tech team. So my scope is you know, uh, broader than RPA. I mean, we've got software development engineers, we've got BI engineers, product management uh, functions, uh, and so forth. Um, I, you know, my mental model when it comes to, to culture and, and, and moving people along is you've got kind of three different personas. You've got, you know, the early adopters or the people who are really enthusiastic about your team, and those are your sponsors, your stakeholders, um, you know, people raising their hand. I think you've got the majority of people within, you know, an enterprise who are sort of data-driven, skeptical from a healthy way about, um, you know, investment. They want to see data. They want to see quick wins. And then you're going to have a certain percentage of your population that are, I call them, you know, negative Nellies. But you really focus on the first two. Um, so that was our approach. And then, you know, one of the, I don't know if it's a killer use case, but it was a practical one from an RPA perspective, uh, was our workers' compensation in, um, in Canada. It was one of the first things we did. And so, you know, we, um, if you think about workers' comp or just claims administration, it's very, very, I mean, that whole industry is very paper-oriented. So you think about things like doctor's notes, you think about, you know, insurance forms, you think about a workers' compensation analyst um, who is, you know, manually looking up, in, you know, data um, and, and copy-pasting and stuff. And, you know, this is not a long-term scalable process. And so, um, you know, there's a, there's a term that Amazon's coins called starting with the customer and working backwards. So our customer in this case was one person. So we start with one person. How can we simplify your experience? How can we make your job easier? Um, and we took 20 hours uh, a week. I mean, 20 hours. So, you know, there was a data point I think I read in a PwC uh, finding that, you know, finance professionals spend pretty much half their time looking for data versus analyzing data. And you don't come to companies like a PwC or, or an Amazon to, you know, go truffle hunting for data. So, um, it, you know, it's like you start small and then you learn and uh, what we did is like we took, you know, we replicated that to a few other people. This was specific to the Ontario province in Canada for workers' compensation. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, two or three people in, you're saving half of their work week, you've got a story. And, um, you know, one of the things about Amazon is we do a lot of writing. Uh, I made a joke yesterday about, you know, the... <laughs> Uh, how our slides look, because we're not PowerPoint experts by any stretch. And typically what we do for most communication is we write a doc, right? Whether it's a two-pager or a six-pager, we write a doc. Um, and then we sit in a room, and everyone for the first 30 minutes is, is reading the doc. Um, that's one way, you know, because it's data-driven. But we created a marketing video, actually, um, you know, with, with testimonials from uh, these analysts there. And man, the excitement that it generated. We played it at our town halls. We sent it to our CFO. Um, you know, it just got a lot of momentum going, so it was a lot of fun. Yeah, and no, I, I, I find the, the, you know, the writing of the document piece interesting to describe really what's happening, but I think actually being able to see the automations in practice was, ended up being uh, one, one of the more powerful aspects. Um, okay, so, you know, as we move from that, that first chapter, you're now gaining excitement, you really get into the second chapter, which is about scale. And, you know, I think scale often goes in two different directions. One. How do you find you know, bigger and more complex and, and higher volume use cases? But then I think in an organization like the way you described Amazon's treasury function, um, it also goes in the direction of how do you uh, train your citizens uh, both to find ideas and maybe to help develop and build those ideas. So I, I think citizen-led development is one of those um, buzzwords that can mean a lot of different things to different people. And I know there's been a lot of discussion at this this conference on that. How did you guys think about this? Um, you know, what was the case for action? And I think one of the things we were, we were talking about backstage is like the concept of a, a center of excellence, just culturally in Amazon, doesn't make as much sense. So I think part of the challenge is also framing, um, you know, how do how do citizens fit with with experts? So how did you think about that? Yeah, um, you know, a number of things. Uh, you know, first and foremost, let me say that Amazon really indexes heavily on um, software development. So. The majority of tech teams have, you know, lion's share of software development engineers. Uh, we lean towards build versus buy um, quite frequently. A lot of that is due to necessity. There's, you know, uh, the complexity that we have, the scale that we have um, requires a lot of internally software development. And so, the way I think about software, or sorry, citizen automation is, you've like, let's take that Canada use case for example. You know, 20 hours a week for two analysts is never going to make it on tech roadmap. I mean, it may, but, but the, the majority of the time it doesn't. And so, um, you know, being data-driven, we look at things like connection scores. So connections for us is every time you log on 
uh, there's questions. Do I like my manager? You know, how satisfied am I with my job? You know, and there's questions like, is technology working for us? Um, you know, what percentage of my work is, is manual and repetitive? And so we see this high you know, uh, investment on software development, and that really, you know, it, it helps us achieve scale for a lot of the big builder items. But you inherently are going to have some white space. You're inherently going to have, um, you know, a lot of use cases that don't make it onto those tech roadmaps. And so it really starts with, and not to be cliche-ish about Amazon, is we start with the customer and work backwards. So, you know, our customers, my treasury analysts, tra you know, traders, um, you know, risk managers, uh, it, you know, we start with them, uh, and we look at like what's going to make them happy. So I think, you know, from a citizen perspective, how we define it is there's no one definition. There's probably four or five things that I think about, starting with employee satisfaction. That's number one. I mean, you start with with, with, with that. Number two is our leadership principle around ownership. Um, I, I just don't subscribe to the model where everything that needs to be automated needs to be a centralized engineering team or tech team. Um, you know, if you look at the curriculum at University of Washington and you graduate with an accounting degree, 70% um, of your coursework is tech. And so a lot of the, you know, new joiners to the workforce can do this. Um, and so it's giving them the tools they need to be, uh, or giving them the tools to be successful. And so, you know, we're seeing quite a big demand, Kevin. Um, you know, in our org right now, we've got about 10% of of our employees across the 30 insurance programs, across all divisions of Treasury, um, who are raising their hand saying, I want to be upskilled. Um, I want to be, you know, certified. And, you know, had it not been for COVID, I'd probably say that number would be 2x because, you know, we kind of lost some momentum around, like, on-site boot camps and those, those types of things. Um, so it's, you know, it's been a journey, but, you know, big demand for citizen development. And we're still trying to figure out how we're going to scale it across the enterprise, right? Because we've got multiple COEs. Um, and that's one of the things about Amazon is we've got a lot of, call it federated tech teams that operate, you know, you know embedded within a certain business. Um, and so how we align that is going to be, you know, kind of our next step um, in terms of getting, you know, true scale. Uh, interesting. And I think there's, there's two different things I'm, I'm, I'm picking up from that. I think one is, um, you know, the, the phase from scaling really goes from kind of scale, like how do, we, how do you build more bots in more areas into more of a people discussion and how do you think about actually, the, you know, what is the, the treasury analyst of the future and the skills that that analyst needs to be successful. So maybe we can spend a minute on that and then I want to play on some of the Amazon organizational challenges because I also think in a, in a large organization there, there's probably some interesting learnings to that. But maybe let, let, let's start with the, the, the first piece is you start to look at, um, you know, that, that future treasury professional. Um, it, it's great people are raising their hands. How do you see the organization um, incentivizing and recognizing the skills and, um, and, and, how, and, and how do you think this is going to make the citizen-led concept stick long-term within your function? You know, it goes back to, um, you know, data is king. And, you know, if, if the, the, the treasury professional today or the treasury professional tomorrow needs to spend time looking up data and doing manual work, they're not going to be at Amazon for long. Um, so we look at, you know, this is, uh, you know, one lever of retention and, and job growth, right? So how do we upskill? Um, you know, how do we uh, improve their jobs with straight through processing? And, you know, look, there's no magic bullet for this type of stuff. Um, so, you know, RPA to me is one of our more important levers, um, but we also are investing heavily in, you know, a new treasury workstation that's hosted on AWS, um, you know, with some custom configuration and development to really do, you know, straight through processing. So if I think about like, you know, treasury from like the initiation of a deal, I want to issue commercial paper, I want to, you know, um, open a bank account, I want to close a bank account, um, I want to move cash. Um, right now we've got kind of, you know, still have some siloed between teams. And so we're trying to make everything digitized and everything streamlined. And so, you know, there's the part that my team plays around like an implementation of a treasury workstation where there is white space, we can use RPA or we can use some other levers. Um, and then a lot of internal integrations as well, you know, to like automate journal entries for accounting, for example. So, um, you know, and then on the risk side, it's, it's really kind of, you know, multiple levers too. It's uh, implementing a new um, risk management information system, 
um, lots and lots of RPA, right? And I think what we're also trying to do when it comes to like, you know, the future is we don't want to just automate a bad process. We want to look at the process, diagnose it, figure out what we can simplify, and then use you use bot to actually improve it even further. So, um, you know, the one thing I haven't mentioned too is. You know, we've been talking about kind of the, the, the treasury professional and it, uh, customer satisfaction, but really, you know, controllership is really important. Um, uh, you know, and I think that that's kind of like if there's customer sat and controllership is like a 1A and a 1B. Uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of efficiencies that RPA is driving, um, you know, where you have scripts for like things like cash positioning that are very, you know, manual and like if you make a mistake, you can have an overdraft and incur fees. And so we're seeing an uptick in uh, controllership as a, re you know, as a result of this too. Interesting. And I think there's, uh, you know, a, a good um, key message coming out of the, the, the statement around the benefits case and, and the ROI. I know that was the theme to the talk. Um, you know, I think, you know, often in the, in the automation space, one of the things we at PWCC is kind of this focus on hour saved, hour saved, let, let's get the metric, and that's your, your primary metric. But I think most organizations don't do a good job of explaining what benefit is being derived from those hours saved or what is it. And I think one of the, you know, I think this, this may not be, this may be more by necessity than by choice, but given the size of your organization, the distributed nature of the processes, the fast growing nature of Amazon and having to deal with crazy things like the amount of, you know, drivers and warehouse space and everything else, there's really um, a benefits case around quality, controllership, employee experience, customer experience. And unless you can actually flip from hour saved into all those categories, um, you're probably missing um, articulating the, the, the vision of the program. Um, so maybe one final question um, a, a, as we're finishing. Um, you know, look out into the future, um, you know, the, the next couple of years. What's your vision of, of where you want to be? You talked a little bit about some of the bigger technology investments. Um, I think there's a really good lesson in here around, you know, aut automation should not be a separate thing off on the side. It should be embedded with your technology strategy. But, you know, where, where, where do you see this going? Well, I think we need to have some, some more alignment internally. I mean, Amazon Finance is, you know, very, very large, thousands of employees, right? And you've got multiple tech teams. Um, so having a common strategy or COE around low-code automation is something that we're going to be driving towards. Um, you know, and, and really, like, I mean, it, it, it kind of comes back to the employee um, and the connection scores and improving things like retention, improving things like job satisfaction, improving controllership, improving the accuracy and the data quality. That's where we start. And then we work backwards from that. So working backwards from that is going to be, from an RPA perspective, um, more citizen development um, in a controlled fashion. Uh, we'd love to have a bot for everyone who wants to have a bot. Raise your hand and we'll upskill you. Uh, why would we say no to that? Um, so. You know, I think that's the journey we're on right now. Okay, I think that that's a good ending. Well, thank you for everyone for attending. Uh, we're, we're both around uh, offline if anyone wants to ask questions. So thank you. Thank you. Here we go this way.